Welcome to PALS. It's Prof. Sanya Wusa Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us or you have not subscribed, we would like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. In today's lecture, we'll be considering the gross anatomy of the lungs. This lecture is divided into three parts. Part one, which you're watching now, will be focused on the basic anatomical features of the lungs. Part two will be on the bronchial tree, bronchopulmonary segments, and innervation and blood supply to the lungs. And part three will be on applied anatomy of the lungs and clinical correlates. We will also answer some multiple choice questions from various examination boards on the lungs. So let's go to class. We will start our lecture by looking at the color of the lungs at the various stages of life, the size in terms of weight, and finally the texture. The lungs are the main organs for respiration, rosy pink in color at the time of birth, but usually turns to brownish in young ones, except for individuals living in clean environments that are void of various air pollutants. It finally becomes mottled black in adults and smokers due to the position of carbonaceous particles in the lung tissues. The right lung is a little bigger than the left lung, averagely weighs about 600 grams, while the left weighs about 550 grams. The adult lungs are spongy in texture and are crepitant to touch. This is as a result of the presence of air in its numerous alveoli. This is in contrast with the lungs of fetuses and the stillborn children that the lungs are solid in texture and do not crepitate when you touch them. This is as a result of the absence of air in the alveoli. These lungs are located in the thoracic cavity and inside the thoracic cavity, each lung is enclosed inside a membranous cavity called the pleural sac or pleural cavity. There is a space between the two lungs. This space is called the mediastinum. The lung has the following features. 1. The apex, 2. The base, 3. Borders, and surfaces. We will start with the apex. This region of the lung is called the apex. It is the rounded superior end of the lung. As a result of the slanting nature of the superior thoracic aperture, the apex of the lung lies within the thoracic cavity from posterior view, but projects above the superior thoracic aperture from the anterior view. As a result, it projects above the rib and clavicle into the root of the neck anteriorly. So it's about 3 cm superior to the anterior end of the first rib and 2.5 cm above the medial one third of the clavicle. This part of the lung is lined by two membranes, the cervical pleura and suprapleural membrane. Now the base. This is the lower part of the lung that relates with the diaphragm inferiorly. As a result, it is called the diaphragmatic surface. It has a semilunar concave curvature. The concavity of the base of the right is deeper than that of the left due to the higher level of the liver underneath the right side of the diaphragm. We have three borders, the anterior, the posterior, and inferior borders. First, the anterior border. This is the anterior border of the lung. It is thin and shorter than the posterior border. It separates the medial surface from the coastal surface anteriorly. This border for the right lung runs continuously vertical, but in the left lung, it is deeply notched posterior to the fifth coastal cartilage by the pericardium. The notched area is called the area of superficial cardiac dullness, and percussion of the heart sound in this area gives a dull note. Below this cardiac notch is a tongue-shaped projection of the lung called lingula, the inferior border. This is the inferior border. It is also thin and sharp. 
circular in shape and is located in the distal part of the lung. It separates the base from the coastal and medial surfaces of the lung. This is the posterior border. It is thick and ill-defined as a result of its rounded nature. It's longer than the anterior border. It is the, it is the posterior part of the lung that fits into the deep paravertebral groove or gutter. This border separates the medial surface of the lung from the coastal surface posteriorly. It extends from C7 to T10. For the surfaces, there are two surfaces, the coastal surface and the medial surface. The medial surface has two parts, the posterior part and the mediastinal part. First, the coastal surface. Represented in this illustration is the coastal surface. It lies adjacent to the ribs and intercostal spaces of the thoracic wall. It is large, smooth and convex and is covered by the coastal pleura and the endothoracic fascia. This is the medial surface. It is the part that lies against the mediastinum anteriorly and the vertebral column posteriorly. The vertebral part of this surface relates with structures around the vertebral column. And some of these structures are the intervertebral discs, the posterior intercostal vessels, and the splanchnic nerves. The mediastinal part presents the hilum and relates with structures around the mediastinum. We shall consider structures around the mediastinum in more details. Since the structures relating with the mediastinal surface of the right lung are different from those relating with the left lung, we will consider the mediastinal surface of both lungs differently. We will start with the right mediastinal surface. So forming the impressions on the right mediastinal surface are the right atrium, the superior vena cava with some of its tributaries like the brachiocephalic vein above the concavity of the right atrium and also the azygous vein forming an, an arch over the hilum of the right atrium and also behind the hilum of the right atrium. We have the trachea, the oesophagus seen behind the right atrium and the vessels. We also have some neural structures. The first is the right phrenic nerve which is seen anterior to the hilum. We also see the vagus nerve behind the hilum and then thirdly we have the right sympathetic chain. Now we'll look at structures forming the relations on the left mediastinal surface. The left ventricle makes the deep cardiac impression on the left lung. Now we have the arch of aorta coming out from the left ventricle with its major branches also making impressions on the left mediastinal surface. We have the descending aorta and then we have these branches from the arch of aorta. We have the brachiocephalic trunk. We have the left common carotid artery. We also have the left subclavian artery. Then we have the oesophagus and also the three neural structures we've mentioned earlier in the right lung the phrenic nerve, the vagus nerve, and the sympathetic chain. The lungs are separated into lobes by clefts called fissures. The right lung has two fissures, while the left has only one. The fissures are one, an oblique fissure seen in both right and left lungs, and two, a horizontal fissure seen only in the right lung. The right lung is divided into superior, middle, and inferior lobes by both fissures, while the left lung is divided into superior and inferior lobe by only the oblique fissure. We will start with the oblique fissure. It is the main fissure of the lungs. It begins posteriorly at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra. It is level with the vertebral border of the scapula when the arm is fully abducted and above the head. This fissure then passes anterior inferiorly 
to meet the inferior margin of the lung close to the cyst costochondral junction. The fissure cuts through the substance of the lung except at the hilum, dividing the lung into superior and inferior lobes. In the right lung, it separates the superior and middle lobes from the inferior lobe. The horizontal fissure. It is a short fissure present only in the right lung. It extends from anterior margin at the level of fourth costal cartilage. It runs horizontally backwards to meet the oblique fissure in the mid axillary line. Pulmonary pleura extends into these fissures of the lungs and by this enabling the lobes of the lungs to move on each other during respiration. Next, we consider the lung hilum. The hilum is a large depressed region of the lung that lies near the center of the medial surface here. Various structures enter and leave the lung via the hilum. The hilum of each lung lies approximately behind the third and fourth costal cartilages at the sternum margin or at the level of T5 to T7 vertebra. The root of each lung is a short tubular collection of structures that together attach the lung to structures in the metastinum. It is made up of structures entering and leaving the lung at the hilum. It is wrapped by a sleeve of medicinal pleura that reflects onto the surface of the lung as viscera pleura. This pleura further extends distal to the hilum as a narrow fold called the pulmonary ligament, as we can see in this illustration. The root of the lung has a number of components, and they include one, the principal bronchus for the left lung, and a parterial and hypaterial bronchi in the right lung, two, the pulmonary artery, three, the pulmonary veins, four, the bronchial arteries, five, the bronchial veins, six, the lymphatics of the lungs, and then finally, anterior and posterior pulmonary plexuses of the nerves. The arrangement of structures in the root, arranged from anteriorly backwards, we have the pulmonary vein, that's the superior part of pulmonary vein, we have pulmonary artery behind, and then we have the bronchus, the left principal bronchus on the left side, and epithelial and hypothelial bronchi on the right side. The mnemonic verb can be helpful for easy recall. Now, in the arrangement from above downwards, we have the pulmonary artery for the left lung, followed by the bronchus, and then the inferior pulmonary vein. Also, the mnemonic ABV can be helpful. This shares the same arrangement for the right lung, apart from the fact that the epithelial bronchus enters above the pulmonary artery, as we can see here. So this modifies the earlier mnemonic we've given, where we can use BABV, that's the first B being the epithelial bronchus, and then the second B being for the hypothelial bronchus. Before we wrap up on this section of our lecture, we'll want to recap by a brief comparison of the right and left lungs. First, we'll look at the size and shape. For the right lung, it is larger, it is shorter, and broader, while for the left lung, it is smaller, longer, and narrower. In the weight, the right lung is about 600 grams, and the left lung is about 550 grams. In the number of lobes, the right lung has three, upper, middle, and lower, and the left lung has two, the upper and lower. For the fissure, the right lung has two, horizontal and oblique, and the left lung has one. In the anterior border of both lungs, the right lung has a straight anterior border, while the left lung has a deeply notched anterior border. And for the hilum, the right lung has two bronchi, the epithelial bronchi and hypothelial bronchi, while the left lung has one 
Broncos. This is where we'll end the first part of this lecture. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. The part two of this lecture is on the bronchial tree, bronchopulmonary segment, and innervation and blood supply to the lungs. And there's also a part three, which is on the applied anatomy of the lungs and clinical correlates, and also answers to some multiple choice questions from various examination boards on the lungs. If you have not subscribed, please do it now. And if you like the video, press the like button and also share it to your friends that may need it. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we will make anatomy simple. See you in my next video. Thank you.